Um, wow, the number's really gone up. It's up to 87 now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Naveen, uh, who's our guest speaker for today. Um, Naveen is one of the trustee founders and directors of the Dakshin Sea Foundation. He is a marine biologist who almost became a wildlife ecologist. But luckily for us ocean lovers, he picked marine biology for his master's. And then it went on to do his PhD uh, on the coral reefs around Great Nicobar Island. This was way back in the, the 2000s, the early 2000s. Naveen and the team went on to start the Dakshin Sea Foundation in 2004. The same team with whom he worked with while he was at ATRI, which is the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment. Now the team there realized that the agenda for marine conservation in India had to be built a little differently. And with that goal in mind is where they uh, set up Dakshin. Now more than a decade after its inception, uh, Dakshin has become a critical organization for marine conservation and research in India. Uh, and not, not just on the biology front. N Naveen has worked with various communities and is currently, uh, and currently during the current COVID-19 crisis, the team is working with stranded and distressed fishermen and women across the country to help raise funds to help fisher folk in need who are stranded away from their homes. So, um, yeah, without uh, further ado, I'm going to hand over this to, to Naveen. Naveen, great to have you on board. Hi, uh, thanks Rahul. So, hi, I'm Naveen. I hope you all can see me. Uh, as Rahul mentioned, uh, I'm a marine biologist. I started uh, my work, I mean, started working on marine bi in the field of marine biology from the early 2000s onwards. And uh, a lot of that was as part of my PhD work. And in the last uh, 10, 12 years have been associated with Dakshin Foundation. I, like Rahul mentioned, I'm one of the founding trustees. Dakshin is an organization that works on primarily on coastal and marine conservation related issues. We try to, you know, kind of balance sustainability with our, uh, you know, environmental concerns and, and, and also work a lot with marine systems, but also with the people who, who rely on those systems. Yeah, so I'm going to Get into my presentation. I'll start the share screen. So, uh, so I'm just going to switch off the video. As well. So I'm uh, trying to get my video up, but just can't play it up. But anyway, so um, yeah, so Dakshin is an organization that uh, works on coastal and marine conservation issues. And to begin with, let's. Uh, so the topic that I was given was to try and look at, you know, what are some of the. I mean, to to give a broad introduction on on uh, marine ecology. Uh, but I thought it might be rather than getting into the details of marine ecology, it might be it would be good to try and understand marine systems in a in a much broader context. And you know, quite often uh, we tend to break down things into compartmentalize things into into you know very smaller components, and quite often mix, miss the larger picture. So let me try and begin with you know try and build build in that perspective. And as you go through the rest of the courses through you know, what SSI has been offering, I'm, I'm sure there'll be you know, a lot more detailed information that one would pick up. So, well, to begin with, why, would, why do oceans matter? I mean, why do we need to know about them at all? And you know, the first thing that comes to mind as, a, as an ecologist would be to, you know, to understand the oceans as you know, those systems that where life began, as we all know life began. And, and if one were to look at how life on Earth itself was, you know, has evolved a lot of it, uh, starting from, you know, about 3 billion years ago, Earth itself is around four and a half billion to 5 billion years old. And from 3 billion years back onwards, we had, you know, a lot of the old fossil cells being recorded primarily from the oceans. That's where the life began. And then it's only closer to, you know, 500 million years 
also give and take you know a few hundred million years is when life started colonizing onto land so the remaining two and a half of those three billion years most of the life was only on in found in the ocean so that way understanding oceans is also you know very critical to understanding ourselves as human beings as you know where we come from and what was the what was the entire process of evolution that led to us and you know a lot of the forms that we know of in the in the oceans initially they formed as you know these simple uh, you know tissue not true tissue formation but this, these are just the 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 larger fauna that i'm talking about i'm, I'm not including the when i say larger fauna i meant like i mean like from the invertebrates onwards not the the unicellular organisms but most of the multicellular organisms started evolving as uh, let me just use that like you can see there that's a coenocyte a coenoflagellate which is the most you know primitive kind of organism that formed and and those started forming you know small groups colonies and and you know even the sponges that a lot of us see while we go out diving or when we go exploring the coastlines a lot of the sponges that we see are probably one of the most primitive life forms that are there on earth right now and the same with corals as well corals are the next most primitive life form so you know it's from here that a lot of the life that we see on earth kind of evolved from and if you look at chordates which is a lot of the you know the when we talk about wildlife when we talk about you know animals on on the planet we always think about the vertebrates the ones with vertebral columns but there's an incredible diversity of invertebrates that that generally go unnoticed and and you know that's that's what is contributes to the high diversity on planet earth and that's from an evolutionary perspective right and and if one were to look at this from a from a climate perspective and a lot of this has been uh you know has been thanks to, uh, a lot of the life has been able to survive on on both land and sea thanks to the way the climate has also evolved in a in a conducive fashion that supports life and climate on earth as we know it is largely controlled by the oceans and and as we know it's 75 percentage of you know planet earth is covered by ocean so this has a very strong you know influence on climate and as you can see they contribute to a lot of the you know the weather patterns that we see and disruptions in these are what is leading to you know a lot of the climate change related issues that we see and perceive on a on a day to day basis so they do have a very strong role and and the earlier slide was a lot about how the wind patterns are are you know um kind of circulating across the across planet earth but what these winds do is also drive a lot of the circulation patterns in the ocean ocean is not just a static you know mass of water it's it's a constant dynamic you know free flowing kind of uh you know system with both surface and deep water currents and and here most of the winds that are driven by you know a, a by climatic variations then tend to drive the currents in the ocean and mostly the surface currents and as you can see the red ones here are the warm currents and the black ones here are the are the, are the dark blue ones are the are the cold currents and it's a combination of these you know warm and cold currents that that have kind of structured the oceans the way they are right now and and also leads to has also led to a lot of climatic you know variations across the planet like for instance the scandinavian countries are hospitable despite being up there in the you know in the north is because of the warm gulf stream that takes warm waters from you know the equator all the way up there north so they do have a very strong you know influence on how uh, climate itself is structured and how life on 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 land also is is to a large extent governed by what happens out at sea and in addition to the surface currents there is also you know larger currents that are driven by uh you know differences between in densities and in temperatures um and their salinity so there's something called the global conveyor belt or the uh, the great ocean current as we know it and this is again you know this is how that largely this is how that pattern looks and there's this warm surface currents that 
go all the way up to you know the northern atlantic and when they reach colder areas when the waters become cold they tend to submerge and once they submerge they form part of a so even on the deep down in the ocean floor there are you know cool subsurface currents which again come and you know hit land masses and come all the way back up bringing a lot of nutrients and and you know critical things back up to the surface so you know the point is that the the ocean is also an extremely dynamic system and and what we see in certain sites while we dive or explore are only like you know a small glimpse of of a larger you know a larger kind of scene that's playing out at global scales and economically you know 90% of the international trade that's being carried out currently is through maritime routes and you know what you see there is a map of you know this the the different ships that are i mean it, this is based on shipping routes right and this is the amount of traffic that's being the red ones being the high traffic zones and the blue ones being the low traffic zones and this is the amount of traffic that you know happens on one particular day this is 18th may 2012 i caught it from one of the UN uh, organization website and if you look at the amount of goods that are being traveled you know moved around and globally it's, it's humongous and we're also looking at nearly 15 trillion US dollar worth of commodities traded annually that's that's the contribution that you know maritime trade has towards global economy and and in a large way to you know poverty alleviation and all of that and yeah talking about poverty you know a lot of uh, the developing countries which have access to uh, you know the coastline there is always a large group of people who also rely and depend on these resources um, for their you know a lot of them for subsistence for their you know for their livelihoods for their survival uh, and there are also other kinds of fish uh, you know fishing practices that are not necessarily you know for a subs at a subsistence level but more at an at an industrial scale uh, but you look at it you know there are multiple resources that people harvest from these uh, oceans and have been doing that over centuries and you know a lot of the trade has also been on marine commodities for a fairly long time and also you know communities rely on these resources also from for a, from a nutritional point of view but also for from a uh, i mean for small local trade and and for their livelihoods as well but quite recently particularly in countries like india there are about uh, you know 16 million or so people who who depend on fisheries and its allied sectors for livelihoods and a lot of other you know people globally who you know depend on fisheries as a as a you know survival opportunity and in the in the late 70s or in the early 70s we we saw a transition from a subsistence based fisheries from a very artisanal kind of a fisheries to a more mechanized and industrialized fisheries these are trawl boats from I, this is from gujarat i think um viraval harbor and there are a lot of si similar such you know uh, larger mechanized boats that are being uh, operated now and now what that means is that there's a and this is mainly targeting high value export you know this is thanks to globalization and other you know and all the maritime trade routes and all of that a lot of this is to cater to external you know markets and export driven kind of fisheries and so a lot of the products like shrimps and others which really didn't have much value locally have suddenly found you know new markets in in the western countries who can afford to you know to source a lot of these from the developing nations so what it's led to is a massive increase in industrialization of fisheries it has led to conflicts where you know a lot of the marginalized the small scale fisher communities have been marginalized but also you know kind of led to massive impacts on the on the marine ecosystem by their targets targeting a few of these high value shrimps and prawns it also comes with a lot of you know wastage and you know things that are not really part of the you know main high value products but also still ecologically very you know from a from a environment and ecology perspective these are like really critical species sometimes that get you know unintentionally harvested as part of it and the 
other major developments that one gets to see along the coastline more and more increasingly is it's a great space for developing industry for industrial development because you know getting rid of your of your waste from industrial production it's way more easier to have your uh, production facilities closer to the coast so that you can get you know easily rid of your of your waste so that's that way you know coasts have also been prime areas for industrial development and also quite recently from in the last few decades it's also been you know a highly sought out place for as a tourist destination i'm sorry i don't own that particular building that you see there that's just <laughs> happened to have that name but it's it's this is increasingly a site we see across our coastline and these have implications for you know a lot of the systems that you see the intertidal systems and all of that and yeah it's also a recreational space for local people as well it's one of those spaces that a lot of them kind of you know aggregate and, and like to spend their time during leisure time and i'm going to check if there are any questions and answers before moving on to the next section um so if okay back to see that there are no questions so i'm going to move on to the next um next section and yeah so to try and understand uh you know how marine systems work one also needs to be we do have because we live on land we do have you know on an everyday basis we see and we feel and we kind of relate to a lot of things that happens on land but unfortunately because what happens under sea is not something that we can directly access and witness um you know the way we we manage our oceans the way we manage our our, uh, our coastal and marine resources tend to follow the same practices that we use on land and quite often that doesn't work in fact sometimes it could be more detrimental so uh the i'm going to try and compare i think there's someone who had a question who raised a hand but i can't see the question there so i'm going to uh say you know please leave your question there and i can get to it when i get the next chance um so it's really important to know how you know marine and terrestrial systems are different and one of the main components there is you know what you see right now on the screen which are what we call as the phytoplankton uh on land you see trees right you look outside you see trees and grass these are the things that you know form the foundations of the you know of the food chain like all life is kind of built on you know a lot of the plants and vegetation that we see out out here on land but in sea what takes up their space are these organisms called phytoplankton and they come they uh, a combination of uh you know of microscopic organisms as well as slightly larger uh you know groups like what you call algae the larger macro algae uh, a lot of the phytoplankton are also algae and um, and they are really microscopic it's very difficult to see them with your naked eye uh you know a lot of these are just in under a microscope which is how why they look like this um but these are the these form the basis of life in the ocean and this matters this brings in a big difference in the way how oceans work the marine systems work and how the terrestrial systems work quite often trees grasses are all quite long lived but these organisms that you see on the screen are microscopic and have very quick turnover the, their life spans are very short which means they uh you know they born and die very quickly which means there's a really high turnover rate out there in the oceans when you see uh you know wherever there is a slight amount of nutrient coming in when there wherever there's sunlight available you see plankton invariably forming there and as soon as plankton form you have what you call as um uh, trying to skip this screen yeah what do you call as the zooplankton here but you can see them as illustrations of what are called zooplankton a lot of the plankton form the food for again hundreds of thousands of species of you know microscopic organisms that live in the water column and 
feed on those plankton and they form the secondary level of you know food in the oceans and and secondary level of life on the oceans but also the secondary level of food on the oceans in the oceans and um some of them may not be entirely like tiny zooplankton throughout their life some of them might be just what you call larvae that are young ones or you know tiny offsprings of larger organisms and there are some that are true zooplankton which live their entire life as you know as tiny microscopic floating organisms and we know really we do know a lot of the you know the commonly available zooplankton but still there's a lot we need to learn about you know the planktonic communities out in the in the ocean and they're also very short lived i mean in comparison to the so they what you call the primary consumers and the primary consumers on land are organisms i mean animals like your deers rabbits you know other herbivores that feed on on those things and usually their life spans are much longer in comparison to you know to the primary consumers out in the sea right and the other really um, you know critical component that differentiates the life on sea with life in the ocean with the life on land is what is called the bipartite li lifestyle right and can any of you guess what those things on the screen are you know quite often it's very difficult to kind of figure out these are freshly hatched um, offsprings of of certain organisms and if you look at what organisms they tend they become in the future you see right the one on the left extreme is a i think it's called an echinoproteus larvae of a, of a of a sea star and you have another cyprid larvae of a of a pheronid worm christmas tree worms that a lot of you who dive would have seen in in oceans right and that's how the larvae look and and you know this is how the adults look and same way that's the larvae for an octopus and what you see there on the right extreme is a larvae for a for cone snails it's, it's a particular species of cone snail and and that's the you know that's the kind of key difference between life on earth and this is not just for these kind of larval life stages right a part of their life is uh, is spent as free swimming you know free floating kind of organisms up in the water column and after a certain stage this is what i meant by the you know that particular bipartite life system is that you know another interesting thing to keep in mind is that 98 percentage of the fauna that you see the the animals that you see in the ocean are what you call called the benthic forms benthic means things that are settled down on the bottom of the ocean and 98 percentage all the fish and all the other life that we see freely moving about only comprises 2 percentage of you know life in the ocean and all the other ones are benthic you know benthic organisms that live on the ocean bottom or in the ocean the ocean bottom so yeah so that makes a big difference and and which raises the question of how do they disperse how do they connect how do they you know manage to mate with each other how do they produce offsprings and and that happens because of this particular you know process that you see on the screen which is again the bipartite life history that i was talking about is first they produce these eggs and sperms out it's it's what you call uh, in the next sorry i'll get to that later uh, so they they produce these sperms and eggs which fertilize externally in the water column and once they form small tiny free li living larvae they are free to float around for a significant part of their life history this is you know this is a short window in their life but this short window matters a lot and once they reach a period called competence they settle down and become adults right they settle down on the top on the bottom of the ocean and on whatever substrate that they prefer to and then they become adults and then this whole cycle goes through all over again but then while they are these free swim free swimming you know algae uh, plankton particularly as larvae what what they managed to do is because there are these really intricate this is just a snapshot from you know the the current patterns in the arabian sea 
from a particular time in the, I took this from one of the government websites, Inkoi's websites. And what you see here is, you know, how the currents move during that particular, on that particular day. And this keeps changing through seasons. And depending on when you're born and at what time of the year you're a larvae in the water, you get to, you, you're carried to different places across the, you know, the, the waterscape, right? And you end up in a place that, that could be very far away from your point of origin, say if something originated here in the northern coast of you know, Tamil Nadu, given that there are intense you know, circulation waters, currents moving northwards, it's very much likely that they, a lot of the larvae that are hatched here could end up up north, right? depending on how long they survive in the water as larvae. So, it makes a critical difference in how organisms can disperse across the, like an organism in a, uh, on a land, uh, say for instance, if it's, a, if it's a deer or a fox or some other animal, they, their distribution and range sizes are very limited. They cannot disperse beyond a certain you know, patch of forest or, or whatnot, because they have to physically move from one place to the other. But here we are talking about connections and connectivity across big uh, you know spatial scales and these are not static in time this is just one day when the current patterns look like this but another day could be entirely the opposite which means you know they could it's also dynamic in time so in space and time the oceans are extremely dynamic and when you throw these larvae out there you you don't know you know where they can end up and and because of this the chances of you know the system surviving and coming back is also quite high and we need to understand this before you know trying to intervene and try to you know address some of these issues and concerns and this is what i meant by external fertilization is that you know even from advanced vertebrates like fish uh, these are groupers they're you know much higher up in the evolutionary cycle in the evolutionary chain and they including them and all the way to you know bring, Primitive organisms like coral, they all use the same strategy, which is external fertilization, release your sperms and, you know, eggs into the water and expect them to fertilize and form larvae. So that's something that's very different and not usually seen in, in, on land. And also what's useful to see is how the, you know, web of life is compared, compared, in, compared to the, both land and sea. Right, and on land, what you see on the left is generally a very straightforward, you know, connection. What you see there as primary producers are usually grasses or trees, and from there, there you have herbivores like your your rabbits, your squirrels, and not squirrels, but you know, rabbits and others. Yeah, even squirrels who feed on you know nuts and all of that, and then you have you know insects and others who, who also play the role of, you know, the primary herbivores. And then you have the consumers that eat some of those. So usually the link is, you know, a producer, a consumer, and uh, someone that consumes the, the secondary consumer, which is usually a predator. It could be a bird of prey, it could be a lion, tiger, all of that. And an equivalent for a tiger on in the sea would be a shark, for instance, or it could be orcas, right? And here, like I said, it's the phytoplankton, the plankton that form the base of the food chain. And these phytoplankton are eaten by the zooplankton because none of the other organisms can directly feed on, large organisms can directly feed on the plankton. So a lot of the zooplankton is then fed upon by, say, these kind of organisms called the rotifers, which are again extremely active predatory organisms, but still quite microscopic and small. And they are fed upon by say fish, different types of fish, uh, you know, squids, crabs, and again they get eaten by, you know, slightly larger fish, and then they could get eaten by seals, who could get eaten by sharks, great white sharks, and others, and who, and sometimes even the sharks can get hunted by orcas. So, you know, the 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 web of life is way more complicated in the oceans. Now, what it means in terms of from an ecosystem ecological point of view is that selective removal of say shark fishing is very rampant globally and that that has led to 
you know, considerable concerns about what's happening in the ocean system. So removing a shark from the sea could mean the number of seal populations could go high, and which means, you know, because the, that it's been released from that particular predator, which has been keeping their populations under check. Now that could mean, you know, because their populations have gone high, it could mean some of the fish that they're feeding on their populations have gone down, mm -hmm. and the organisms that this fish used to feed on their populations could go up. So, what happens when you remove a particular group from the, you know, from the complex web that's playing itself out in the oceans? is actually way more complicated. You, it could lead to multiple, you know, unexpected, um, you know, outfalls in the oceans. But it's because the, com the complexity is much less on land, it's easier to predict some of those. Like if you remove a line, you expect the number of deer populations to increase. And if that happens, you expect the number of trees and grasses available to be grazed much higher. And, you know, ultimately the, all their populations will come crashing down. But in, in the marine systems, multiple organisms can also play multiple roles as well. Sometimes a seal could become a top predator in the absence of, you know, a shark. So, so the way these systems play out, you know, it's much more complicated and, and, and interesting as well, right? So that's the differences between land and, and sea, right? And if there are any questions here, I'm happy to take those questions. I can see, uh, you know, a couple of questions. So aquatic ecosystems are more vulnerable than terrestrial. What can we do to recover the lost ecology? Does it take time? So yeah, I'm gonna take that question. So aquatic ecosystems, I think it's critical to distinguish the Aquatic could be both marine and uh, freshwater. Freshwater systems, because they are landlocked up a little bit more, uh, and on land it's it's you know a little bit more better explored. I would say not probably better understood, but better explored, and and uh, at least we know a lot about. We can at least see and witness what's happening there in terms of changes. But I would say they're not really more vulnerable. I would say they're much more resilient. They, they have much more ability to bounce back than the terrestrial systems because of the various factors that I talked about, right? They're dynamic systems and they're extremely, because of their diversity and complexity, they're also extremely resilient as well. And, and unlike land, at least as a marine ecologist, I feel, you know, the sea, the oceans have, have much better resilience and the ability to bounce back. Uh, the next question is really amazed to know that 98 percentage of marine fauna is found in the benthic region. I was wondering if you could highlight the implications of the bottom sea trough. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for raising that question. Um, 98 percentage, yes, 98 percentage of marine fauna is found in the benthic region and which makes them extremely susceptible to, uh, you know, trawling, which is a practice of dredging a net along the along the ocean floor and taking up whatever that comes out. So, unfortunately, like many other fishing practices, trawling is a is a way more wasteful exercise. And I did show some of the, uh, you know, depressing impacts of trawling, but it does have significant impacts on the ocean system, and it affects like I said, the bottom-up structuring of the oceans, right? You're taking up a lot of the benthic organisms that form the basis of the food chain who are critical to, you know, uh, to kind of facilitate the flow of energy and nutrients and all of that across the ocean. So, so in that sense, I think, you know, trawling has multiple impacts. And, and I think increasingly globally, everyone is realizing this and, the fisheries as a sector itself is, you know, moving towards uh, slowly facing out trawling. But um, yeah, but just to answer this, uh, for instance, I'm not... yeah. So to answer your question, the short, long, and short of it is that it does have a very serious impact on the oceans. And currently, you know, 
like I said, there's an increasing understanding of these issues and people are trying to kind of move away from those kind of destructive fishing practices, which is through practice, you know, through, uh, what do you call it, certification of, of some of the marine food that, I mean, the food that comes out of the oceans. Uh, the next question here is by Sesipriya. It's aquatic system, ecosystems are more vulnerable. Okay, I think that question I've taken. Aren't seagrass and seaweed also autotrophs? In the terrestrial system, grass and trees are based on uh, all come in the oceans. The ecosystem. Yeah, so to answer that question by Siddharth Raju, which the question is, you know, aren't seagrass and seaweed also autotrophs? Uh, in the terrestrial system, grass and trees are the base of the food system. So how come in the oceans, it's the phytoplankton and not seagrass? So I'll be answering this question a little bit more in detail later. But like I mentioned earlier, you know, land, life on land came much later. And seagrasses are the only true, uh, you know, terrestrial flora, like plant-based life forms that have move back into the sea. They didn't really, you know, seaweeds are different, which are mostly algae and, and kind of evolved in the sea. But seagrass are, are, you know, a certain group of plants that evolved on land and slowly kind of adapted to life under the sea. And they're all restricted to very seagrass. Seagrasses cannot survive beyond a certain depth, but phytoplankton are found on the surface of the ocean, which means, you know, and see, both algae and sea grasses are all benthic. They require a substrate, which means they cannot live beyond a certain depth where there's no light. So most of the light is available only in the top layer. So that means phytoplankton tend to take up that place. And in terms of biomass, also they're huge. Yeah. I'm done with that. I'm not able to click on that. And another question is, are oil-eating bacteria a threat to marine life? Another question that's been asked by Shivani Sahai is, are oil-eating bacteria a threat to marine life? And the answer is, uh, honestly, I don't know. Uh, I am not aware of, you know, because it's been tried out in a few places, I'm still not very, uh, you know, up to date on some of the mitigation measures. These oil eating bacteria have been used as a way to address massive, massive oil spills without you know, creating more problems. It's been found one as one easy biological remedy to these issues, but I'm not aware of any potential implications of that. Sorry about that. Yeah, so Now that we've talked about the differences between the land and the sea, I think it would be really useful to um, to also look at how the land and sea are connected. So they're not systems that are entirely independent of each other, particularly, you know, from the perspective, from the uh, you know humankind's perfect uh, perspective. So just to kind of understand how land and sea interact, a lot of this happens in the shallow coastal areas, right? And, and we, we've all seen how there are these big massive rivers that drain out into the sea. Um, and a lot of these originate on land as, you know, as when rains fall heavily, right? And once the water is drained into the sea, you know, quite often they form these areas called deltas or estuaries where, you know, when multiple tributaries come and join closer to the ocean and form a large, you know, complex maze of, uh, you know, tributaries, then they're called deltas. If they're independent, you know, rivers coming and joining these oceans, they also, they're generally referred to as estuaries. And these estuaries, these rivers are like the lifeline for many of the uh, you know, marine biodiversity because it's these rivers that bring in a lot of the the nutrients that are required for phytoplankton, like phy the 
NPK, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, along with you know critical micronutrients like iron and all those prerequisites for plankton to grow. Uh, all of that is being, at least on the coastlines, all of that is being supplied from by rivers that bring in these nutrients onto land, and also not just the nutrients; they also bring in a significant amount of sediment in the form of which once they hit the coastline you all you have these you know current currents that move parallel to the coastline and these carry which are called the longshore currents that carry all these sand and nutrients to you know places that are adjoining and help in the formation of sandy beaches and dunes quite often in these areas where the freshwater and the seawater meet and form what is called the brackish water which is usually what you find in estuaries in these areas, you find what are, you know, certain kind of plants that have adapted to live in those areas, which are again called as the mangroves. And then you have corals and, you know, seagrass beds, all of them quite close to these, uh, you know, to the land masses in shallow areas, which all are, you know, contribute to a significant component of the coastal diversity that we find or, and, and we have access to, right? And if you look at, and this is, this particular process is kind of, you know, uh, kind of representing itself at a global scale as well. So if you look at how marine biodiversity is distributed across the globe, what you see is that there are, these red zones are the ones with high biodiversity. And this is the, you know, coral triangle where the pointer is, is where the, the, golden triangle or the really high biodiversity area in the ocean is. So that is because of, you know, there's a maze of islands here as well in the Southeast Asian, um, you know, Papua New Guinea and these areas is, and even in the Great Barrier Reef and all of these places as well, there's a lot of terrigenous runoff, which means runoff from the land into the sea that take, brings in nutrients and everything else and thereby providing ideal, you know, spaces for the plankton to grow and once the plankton bloom you know a lot of the zooplankton and rest of the you know animals start growing there similarly if you look at india as well right but then if you move away from land masses you can see that this diversity slowly kind of comes down right and it becomes lesser and lesser which kind of indicates that you know even a lot of the coastal diversity on out in the sea is also very dependent on you know how closely it's linked to the what happens on land. So usually in areas where there's high runoff from land into the sea, you find much higher diversity and productivity and all of that. And in and this is just I, I'm guessing a lot of you would have seen this. Um, this is just a uh, an illustration to show how the oceans are also structured vertically, right? And and what what we've been looking at. It's mostly horizontally, but if you, one way to look at it vertically, this the ocean is extremely, uh, you know, diff extremely different. Um, a large part of the land, the part of the ocean that we have access to, is this small shelf here, which is called the continental shelf, which is, um, you know, within a two hundred meter depth range, and nearly uh, 50 to 60 percentage or probably even more of the ocean is, you know, the rest of it, which is basically really deep ocean, which is, you know, on an average close to 2,000 to 3,000 meters deep. And in some places goes all the way down to 11,000 meters deep, right? 11 kilometers deep. So that's the, that's how the oceans are structured. So a lot of the diversity and things that we explored and we know about and where we've been associating with the oceans and marine systems are all in the shallow area. And as divers, the sites that we all access is just within that 40 meter range. You know, that's the recreational kind of a type limit. So even in those, that's, that's as much as we are exploring. And, and that's probably like less than a few percentage, like a, a less than 10 percentage or even lesser of the entire oceans in the, I mean, of the entire stretch of, you know, of the entire ocean scape, right? And when you look at it vertically, it also means that 
you know, there are extreme variations in, in who can live there and who can, you know, survive in places like these. So the light, as we know it in most areas, cannot penetrate more than, say, a, a hundred meters, right? The, the light that's necessary for all the photosynthesis to happen, which is why it's really, you know, phytoplankton tend to occupy that role that, you know, plants do provide out in the sea is by actually, uh, you know, being able to occupy that 100 meter, zero to 100 meter kind of a, uh, ideally within the first few 10 meters to 20 meters is where you find most plankton concentration, phytoplankton concentrations. And most life cannot survive beyond that depth. But there are organisms that are, you know, well adapted and evolved to those systems as well and survive in these really deep waters. We're not looking that at them in detail. What we're going to look at is mostly the coastal ecosystems that a lot of us have access to. So I'm going to take a few questions now. And there is a question from Teresa Tong. And the question is, on land we have fungi as an inter intermediary between plant and animals. Does the ocean have a fungi system or is it just the mollusk and crustacean finishing the job of decay flesh? Um, no, there are a lot of other organisms, not necessarily fungi, but a lot of other organisms who play the role of decomposers. And most, a lot of them microbial, but also a lot of the deep sea dwelling forms do tend to uh, so where is the food in the absence of light and productivity, where is the food that, you know, a lot of these deep sea organisms get, a lot of them get the, their foods from, you know, dead matter, dead, say, if it could be a carcass of a blue whale, or it could be some even dead zooplankton that are just sinking and going all the way down to the bottom of the flow, and then they get scavenged upon by fish, sharks, crustaceans and mollusks, like you say, not so much mollusks, but crustaceans, but also a range of other organisms that, you know, that feed on dead decaying matter back in the ocean. Um, gonna take another question by L Larissa Menezes. And the question is, digressing from the current topic, what is the significance of bacteria in areas of Asian uh, of the ocean called oxygen minimum zone with regards to marine ecology? Please enlighten. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna quickly go back to the previous slide that you can see there, right? And oxygen minimum zone is a zone that's increasingly and and currently the research shows that this particular zone has been increasing a lot in the last few decades because of excessive sewage pollution and a lot of other issues. It's basically this zone that is kind of overlaps with the dysphotic zone that you see here below the, just below the 100 meter depth. And this varies from you know, ocean to ocean, but usually around, along, around the 100 meter depth where, you know, the water don't, doesn't mix as well as, you know, the surface waters there is a massive fall in temperature. So somewhere around this point in, you know, the vertical column, there's this sudden drop in temperature. And when that drop in temperature happens, there's also an equivalent drop in the density. It becomes like this increase in density because colder water is more dense. And then there are really high, dense, high density waters again back there. So somewhere in between there forms this, which is called the thermocline or halocline or pycnocline, it has multiple name some all of these overlap significantly in these zones you get uh, high density areas where a lot of the dead organisms and you know decaying matters all of it tend to just stagnate because they're so light that they cannot like unlike a whale carcass they can't break through and sink all the way to the bottom they tend to get aggregated in this particular zone in the middle around the 100 meter depth right and this zone is because there's a lot of sewage and other things also going in, all of it tends to get accumulated in this particular zone, leading to an ocean-wide spread in what you call the, you know, the uh, dead zone formation across the ocean. So that's becoming an increasing concern. Yeah. 
and there's a question again from there's a question again from uh, Siddhartha Raju is what is the reason that biodiversity is concentrated around Southeast Asia and Australia whereas the coasts of North and South America don't appear to be as rich as in biodiversity in the map. Uh, so it's it's an interesting question. So there are quite a lot of hypotheses that the Southeast Asian coastline uh, is a very recent sea, right? About 18,000 years back, a lot of those regions were land because during the last ice age, when the sea level was about 100 meters lower than what it is now. So a lot of those tiny, tiny islands that we see now, all of them were just one big connected landmass. You know, as the sea level started rising, they slowly started filling up those, you know, those low-lying areas and, and slowly different land masses started getting separated from each other. It's hypothesized that because it's a more recent ocean, it has it has had the chance to kind of, because it, the, it's been formed very recently, it's had opportunity to kind of speciate much more recently, right? And it's, it's a very young ocean with a lot of young and new diverse life forms. So, and we're just looking at the global patterns at this point of time, right? This has been happening over millions of years. We're just pausing it now at a very short time scale and looking at these oceans and trying to make sense of it. So, you know, one of the theories that because it's been recently colonized, it's had a lot of different habitats and niches to occupy and it's given and because those areas were colonized, I mean, the water came in from the Indian Ocean as well as from the Pacific. It's at that confluence of two highly diverse ocean basins, which is the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. So it, that also led to a lot of different fauna flora coming, the intermixing of different genetic groups and, you know, new, a lot of different new biodiversity being formed there. Same, pretty much the same applies to Australia as well. Uh, not, Australia is not an, an entirely new coastline, but because it's on the on that verge of you know on the on the periphery of the Indian Ocean and the you know the Southern Ocean and the and the Pacific, it it has really high biodiversity area, and it's all, it also has a very wide east coast of Australia has a very wide continental shelf, which means there's all the more space for coral reef ecosystems to thrive there. The other question from Sasipriya is if land and water are interconnected, why are we still starting at the starting phase of exploring oceans? Uh, I think it's mainly because of access, nothing to do with, I don't think it's to do with intent, but it's just that we don't have access to, like I said, we have access to only 30, 40 meters using scuba and the rest of it is all, you know, right nowadays are 200 to a few more, you know, meters down without having some to use submersibles and other things. So that's how much we have access to. So, you know, it's pretty, uh, you know, pretty intuitive why we know so little about, about the oceans and seas. All right, I'm going to move on to the next uh, slide, which is a quick peek into the, you know, ocean system. So uh, let's begin with the borderline systems here, right? The sandy shores, sand dunes, rocky shores, estuaries and mangroves. These are probably systems that, you know, as divers, a lot of us don't get the chance to go and explore more, but I really would like to, you know, emphasize that these are also equally important, if not significant systems. And what you find on coral reefs, and if you're passionate about conserving and protecting coral reefs, you do need to know about a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about here as well. Right, so to begin with, uh, and these are called the intertidal systems, right? These borderline systems, which I showed you in that, you know, rough sketch of sorts where the rivers and the sea meet. These are also systems that are characterized by tide, the constant ebb and flow of the sea, right? And in this highly dynamic system, you get like a lot of interesting, it, it creates an entirely challenging system altogether. There's high wave action, there's high, Exposure and desiccation, the submergence, you know, the salinity because there's fresh water coming in, the seawater coming in from the other side, a lot of salinity fluctuating 
there's a lot of competition for space happening out there because you know these systems are also very narrow right the between the high tide and the low tide is where all of this happens the systems live so that's also like a really narrow belt and there's a lot of competition for space out there there are also lots of you know issues with predation and other kinds of things you get eaten or you know you die of other problems like high wave action exposure and all of that so let's begin with the sandy shores and sand dunes right and here is a picture i think this is from the southern coast of sri lanka somewhere and what you can see in the on the left all of these are dune systems when you just go and visit a, a, a coastal area which is you know mostly undisturbed you wouldn't pay much attention to these systems here right but they're extremely important systems as well from a coastal perspective increasingly we are seeing cyclonic you know impacts and all of that hitting our coastlines right now as we speak there is cyclone amphan hitting you know the bengal coast and all of that and the best line of defense against a lot of the storm surges and cyclones are the sand sand is the best absorbent of you know of of wave energy and and it just kind of waves just lose their energy pretty much quickly if they have a good buffer between the high tide line and where all the you know infrastructure and human construction and all of those come in and dunes are one of the best you know line of best line of defense if you want to prevent the hinterland and the kind of vegetations that you see on the dunes are also extremely specified and you know adapted to grow on in these areas these are also spaces that are critical for people who live and have been living for centuries across along the coastline right these are places where they use it for you know docking their boats mending their nets even for multiple other recreational activities folks live on sand dunes to kind of protect themselves from you know coastal surges and stuff here's an example of where this is closer to nagapatnam in you know in central coastal tamil nadu on the right you can see the sea out there it's it's and here what you see is a completely you know a uh, well established sand dune system and in the back just that far away from the see and what you see here is freshwater ecosystems here like you know there's a lot of ground water ground fresh water available in these areas thanks to the sand dunes which are able to absorb rain water and you know immediately store them as ground water what you see on the left here are you know is a paddy cultivation going on there so you know thanks to the sand dunes they're able to protect the salt laden winds from coming there as as well as you know recharge the ground water there and these systems are not devoid of life as well they're extremely diverse and you know this systems also not just from an aesthetic point of view but also from a biodiversity point of view they they you know harbor a lot of interesting organisms and the most charismatic among them being turtles this is a picture of a leatherback turtle from the tanaman islands they come and use these beaches and have been doing this for you know for many millions of years they have been using these nests for i mean these beaches for nesting right and then the hatchlings hatch out and, and go out into the sea but aside from those charismatic organisms these are just a few uh, you know organisms we've collected from from the you know sandy beaches along the southeastern coast of of india and what you see here again is just a very very small glimpse of the different kind of organisms here is a crab which is called a mole crab that's extremely interesting its ability to because every time a wave hits this entire sand gets churned up these organisms are adapted to immediately dig back into the sand and you know go and find the and that's how they keep themselves safe and they are really rapid diggers and which means and and also extremely interesting organisms they are hermaphrodites which means when they are small they are all females and once they grow beyond 11 mm as if i remember right they become all male so you know lots of interesting things and interesting flora fauna there these are all organisms that are really microscopic um incredible diversity of worms so the way we sample it is we collect the sand run them through a sieve that all the sand sieve out but then you know sometimes along with the sand you you take these it's very painstaking you have to sit down and you dye them add a certain dye to make them stand out and then you extract them and you look at them under the microscope and study them and here are 
lots of different mollusks like bivalves like these again are designed to live in the in high wave areas you know there are these kind of gastropods and and others that are entirely adapted to live in these areas okay we seem to have faced a small technical issue here uh i think uh, navin seems to have dropped out on his uh, connection kindly give us about 2 to 5 minutes to just sort this out please uh All right, i think navin's back i'm back i think there was a small uh, connection drop about... in the network yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, right. your screen so, sharing is has gone off yeah i have done that okay sorry about that so yeah and then moving on to the other intertidal ecosystems again systems that you found find in between the land and sea are these systems that are called the rocky shore system right on if you just see and not just rocky shores any hard substratum you go to jetties the pillars of the jetties are fantastic spaces to go and explore marine life you find incredible diversities on you know something as simple as a pillar out there at sea and you know you might encounter a lot of interesting forms these are not big and obvious and charismatic like a lot of the fish and you know sharks and turtles and other stuff you know mantas and stuff but they're also equally fascinating there's a rock from uh you know place called wandur in the andamans and it's been completely sculpted by these you know by waves and wind but mainly by the organisms that are there a lot of these organisms are difficult to spot here but you know they're quite fascinating and here are more close up shots of these these are the kind of organisms that you see on living on these uh rocks right and they are also exposed to heavy wave action here on rocks they don't have the option to dig in so they need to compensate for them that particular lack of you know that lack of flexibility by holding on to the rock equally hard i mean hard enough that you don't get wiped away by every time a wave comes and hits you and you see these tiny barnacles here these are what you call barnacles the ones that you see you know out there and there are tiny barnacles as well as these larger barnacles and then what you see is this big snail that is feeding on those barnacles right they they are predatory snails the way they all of this moves at very slow pace you can walk none of them are going to run away from you you can walk up to a rock spend hours watching these things you know interact with each other and they're quite fascinating as well uh, a lot of the exploration of the marine systems happened on you know rocky shores as well and here's again what you also see out there is not just to go and look at some of these organisms but also look at the way they kind of uh, you know you see these interesting patterns also play out what you see here is on top is all these barnacles that have settled down on them they haven't survived into adults yet but below these cone shaped ones are what you call limpets and they are a kind of snail and what you can see here is they're all preferring the space which is under a shade it's a small cleft in the rock and they've all kind of managed to aggregate or trying to aggregate themselves in those areas where there's a bit of shade so that they can stay away from the sun whenever the tide goes down these guys are exposed to the sun and they could easily desiccate and you know dry out and die so not just are they adapted to hold on fast onto the rocks but they also tend to prefer these areas where so you see how light waves and all these other non living you know what we call the abiotic parameters factors also help in structuring the systems and here is another predator and the barnacles have managed to grow on top of back of the predator itself and you know what better place to hide you also see a lot of organisms like these these are again a certain kind of mollusk but they are herbivores they feed on the algae and other things that deposit on the rocks and they don't move along around much so what they do is while they eat they also tend to erode the rocks and that's the the first picture that i showed you with that heavily sculpted rock is thanks to a lot of these organisms that have left these you know depressions and and these are two different kinds of you know these are called the chitons on the left and right both these chitons are you know hardcore herbivores and 
great ex places to explore. Even these pools that you see in the foreground are all great places to explore. You know, once you go and look into a tidal pool, you'll say incredible life forms. And some of them are adopted and evolved to just survive only in these tide pools. So they're really fascinating systems. And like I said, because of the you know, interaction between the abiotic and the biological features of these organisms, they kind of bring in these brilliant patterns. This is from the Pacific, you know, just to show this as an illustration. What you see in the bottom are these patterns, you know, huge belts of different kinds of sea, sea weeds and sea, you know, and other kinds of organisms growing there, like a lot of plant material growing there because they are towards the lower intertidal layers where they get more submerged. And this is the mid tidal, right? They get exposed and submerged a lot more. And here, even within that, you see certain kinds of zonation patterns. And you see mussels and barnacles and other kinds of organisms growing in a certain area because they cannot live up there because they need to get submerged a lot more. right? And here are bar barnacles and others who dominate. And top here, the what you call the supratidal or the upper intertidal areas are dominated by organisms like those limpets and periwinkles and algae and all of encrusting algae and a few of others, right? Now, people have, when you talk about marine systems, a lot of the initial exploration of marine systems happened on rocky intertidal surfaces. And it caught people's attention that you know, there are these clear belts of stratification on less than a meter, you know, tall rock. So that, that caught people's attention and they started looking at, you know, how these things interact. And these are just, what I talked about is just structuring based on how the environment structures them. But now other factors, they compete with each other as well, right? It's not that the muscles can't grow in the seaweed belt, but seaweeds are better adapted to grow here. They outcompete the muscles in this area. Muscles cannot grow over, they just mother all the muscles who by chance manage to, you know, settle down in the lower intertidal, they get covered by these. So then, you know, there are also these interspecies interactions that go on that kind of lead to very interesting structures. So these are all things that one can look out for when you have access to marine systems, not just, uh, I mean, of course, the underwater coral reef ecosystems are exciting, but equally exciting are all these other systems. And you know, the mangoes that I talked about earlier as well, again, systems that fringe the sea and the land, right? They're found in that in, in area of intersection. And mangroves are also extremely fascinating. They're squishy, they're, you know, they are smelly, but once you get to explore the mangroves, you'll again love it. They, they live in an area that's squishy and slushy because, you know, they basically help trap a lot of the sediments that the, you know, the rivers bring in. And which is why the, Brahmaputra and Gain, Ganges and Yamuna kind of, you know, that big three massive rivers, that delta that they formed in the northwestern part of, northeastern part of India is, uh, coastal India is, you know, this is the reason why we have the world's largest mangrove patch, which is the Sundarbans growing there. And, you know, they're extremely productive. They also kind of supply a lot of nutrients to near shore systems. And they also have a lot of interesting flora and fauna, like these gastropods, a lot of them feed on the dead and decaying leaves that fall down. You have interesting organisms like the mudskeeper here who is capable of, you know, living on land when the tides recede and also, you know, going and burying itself under, under the substrate when the tides come in. So you have a lot of interesting crabs like the fiddlers, a lot of them have interesting stories about, you know, about each of them. And mangroves are also critical world globally. No, now people are increasingly under realizing that mangroves are really valuable systems as well, because they live in these areas between the coast and the between the you know land and the sea. They are also the ones that get exploited and you know cut down quite a lot when you want to build aquaculture farms or when you want to build coastal infrastructure. These are the you know, kind of vegetations that people didn't realize for the longest of time, the value of these systems, but they also tend to be nurseries where a lot of the juveniles and of multiple, you know, commercially important fish species grow as well, as well as, uh, you know, they also protect the coastline from, you know, from a lot of the storm surges and, and such things as well. They form a good 
shelter bell for the post length right and you see very interesting invertebrate i mean vertebrates as well like this uh, mo water monitor lizard that we encountered in a mangrove system these are pretty much like the top predators that you find on in mangrove systems they're not specialist mangroves but they do depend a lot on on mangroves ecosystem as well and again great places to explore and learn you know especially for children if they get a chance to visit the mangrove system with the right kind of people to show them around the absolutely fascinating systems and now getting to the truly marine systems the ones that are subtidal below the low tide line uh, i'm not going to talk a lot about the coral reef ecosystems because i'm guessing a lot of that will be covered through you know other sessions in 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 future but i'm going to just quickly glimpse over this and this is a question that someone had asked is you know why are uh, algae and and you know sea grasses not not the primary producers in the sea and why is it phytoplankton so if you look at how sea grasses evolved you know initially there were all these marine flora that that slowly kind of managed to get on to land and the green algae are the ones that kind of moved on to land and initial land you know plants that came on land are the ferns and then came the conifers and then the dicots and then the monocots which is basically the bamboos and the grass varieties and some of these managed to interestingly none of the others managed to go back but some of the monocots which are the most you know most uh, advanced form of uh, you know plant life they've managed to go back into the sea into the shallow areas within in the sea and it's only one particular group of monoco monocots which is the alismatid monocots that managed to evolve into what we currently know as sea grasses again sea grass systems are also extremely productive they may look like you know simple grasslands but like how grasslands on land are really valuable systems similarly sea grass meadows in the oceans are also extremely important systems and they are known to be excellent sinks for um, you know the carbon dioxide in the oceans but also there are specialist organisms that live only in sea depending on sea grass beds and most popular of them are among them being the dugongs and as you can see this is you know one of the largest mega herbivore in the oceans that entirely is reliant on sea grass beds and their health for you know survival and as we know their populations have decreased a lot globally there are also many sea turtle species like green turtles uh, who rely on and during the adult stages rely extensively on sea grass ecosystem sea grasses to forage upon right and yeah so they they're also extremely exciting systems as well and then there are coral reefs like i said i'm not going to talk much about the reefs here uh, because this is going to be covered extensively in future but again extremely diverse ecosystems compared to tropical rainforests and coral reef ecosystems are you know pretty much compared comparable in terms of the diversity they can harbor and extremely competitive spaces on in a healthy reef ecosystem there's constant competition between different species of corals to try and you know budge each other all because like i said the shallow area available for them to colonize itself is very less and within that space you know real estate is like real real prime you know prime value so so there's a lot of interesting competitions and interactions that you may see sometimes it's between corals sometimes it's between algae and coral sometimes it's between sponges and corals but in each and every site you dive you would see these clear signatures that as a marine ecologist these are the things that kind of strike me as soon as i enter into a water system as you know you also look at how different groups of organisms are interacting with each other which is again quite spectacular and what's interesting is about about the coral reefs is also the the kind of three dimensional spaces it creates right like trees in the forest it's not just that the corals themselves contribute to the diversity but they create these incredible niches and you know incredible habitats that a range of other organisms can occupy not just fish which is the most obvious one but yikes i don't know how this painting came on top of this but um, basically in the background if you i don't know why it's getting painted across but 
what you can see here is a section of a coral, and I hope you can see that. Um, what I'd like to show here is that if you take a section of the coral, on top you might just see very few, you know, uh, openings on top, but if you section a coral, a dead coral substrate or even a live one, what you see is an incredible diversity of life inside. It's like this honeycomb of structures inside that's occupied by, say, organisms like cypanculins, there are polychaetes, you know, here are certain kinds of barnacles that have managed to drill into corals. Here are certain bivalves, the chitons and others. So, in cre and if you zoom in, you see like in a large group of, you know, tiny microscopic organisms as well that live inside these. So, it's not just what you see outside. It's believed that nearly 70 to 80 percentage of life on coral reefs are actually living inside those big structures that you see on coral you know, on reefs. Sometimes you see these Christmas tree worms and only their tops on top, you know, their colorful, you know, um, proboscis that you see outside, but inside it's an entirely different universe altogether. And this is pretty much what I was looking at as part of my PhD work in the Nicobars. And also it's an, in, it's, I mean, not just the, the wow aspect to reefs, it's also an interesting space where you can see so many uh, you know, phenomenal interactions between different groups of organisms like the clown fish and the sea anemones are like one of the most popular ones, but you see incredible number of such interactions. And these are, have developed over, you know, years and years of, you know, probably even more than a mu few million years of, you know, evolutionary forces working on them. And these interactions are not something to be, you know, so most of the divers would you would know there are what you call cleaning stations in the water, right? Where we have these cleaner rasas who come and clean you up. Again, interactions that have been you know, a lot of these things that you see, the the formation of coral itself is like a, a few million year, year old kind of an interaction between a certain algae and the coral. There's the symbiotic relationship. So these reefs are also like completely full of these very interesting interactions between different groups. The fish evolved many million years after the, the sea anemone itself evolved. But, you know, once they've evolved, these particular groups have kind of managed to make the anemones their host, thereby kind of protecting themselves. Right. So with that, I'm going to wrap up this talk. And uh, unfortunately, this is like a, a series of lectures that we usually try and, you know, an introduction to marine ecology is like a series of lectures that we give to students when trying to kind of cram all of that in and kind of make it more accessible to all of you. So, you know, I'm sorry if I've just skimmed past many of these um, topics, but in summary, you know, what would, what we've covered is basically trying to understand why these oceans are valuable. You know, they're economically valuable, but more importantly, they're evolutionarily like that's where we all life on earth originated. So, you know, we really need to kind of, widen our understanding about these and about these systems to better understand you know who we are and 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 better understand planet earth as well right and then there also we also kind of looked at the differences between the terrestrial systems as well as the you know the marine systems which is again really critical if if you are interested in in trying to make a difference for the oceans you really need to know how they are different from the you know things on land Quite often, you know, when you're thinking of marine conservation, the general approach to declare areas is protected. But like I said, you know, there's no, you can't draw lines in a, unlike how you can demarcate a particular forest patch and say that, hey, this is a good patch of forest and we want to protect it. Those kind of, this is very dynamic in the oceans, right? And so it becomes all the more difficult to think of ways to manage and protect them. We also looked at how land and sea are connected, right? And how those connections are very important for, especially for the coastal, the coastal and coastal marine systems. And we also had a quick peek at these systems, right? What I'd like to have is, you know, takeaways for a lot of you who are all people who are in some way or the other, I'm guessing, you know, interested in the oceans or do dive or plan to dive in future, you know, 
every opportunity you, you get to get inside the water or you know explore systems from in coastal areas you need to understand that those systems that you're entering are systems that have evolved over you know that's a product of years of years of millions of years of evolution right so a sponge that you're looking at is something that's evolved it's one of the most primitive form there's just a collection of those coanocyte kind of cells that i showed you in the beginning it's just a amorphous mix it doesn't have like designated you know body parts but it still manages it's managed to survive to this you know to to the current uh, period so some of these are like really age old organisms and things and and you know when you look at it try and appreciate them for you know what they are and i think that way you tend to also kind of respect them a lot more and also look at you know life on land like i like we saw from these various examples is that they're not entirely disconnected they're both very closely connected so don't assume that what you do on land like you all the sewage and all the pollutants that go out from land is also like having a really serious impact on the on in the coastal areas and you know like i said the oxygen minimum layer that people have been increasingly working on in recent years it is clear evidence that there's a dead zone spreading across the oceans killing life everywhere right so it's really important to know that what we do on land also has implications for life on ocean so it's not like they're living in an entirely different system which is disconnected from you know that doesn't get affected by the human footprint and also not just be thinking of stuff in water but also in those intertidal areas that i talked about there are fascinating and really interesting organisms there and you know there's a lot to learn and and look forward to to you know kind of learn in these systems as well so so you know and easily accessible and easier ways to understand our oceans and systems better with that i'm going to wrap up i think i've taken up a lot a lot of time here but uh sorry uh, i'm going to go back to share screen I'm going to take the questions one by one. Uh, there's Zeba Mupin who's asked, "Web of life on land isn't as distributed by direct human consumption as animals for consumption are mostly far farmed, ignoring deforestation and indirect effects. This is different in the ocean as most fish consumption comes from wild and less so farmed." would exclusively farming then decrease the impact of it um yeah that's a good question but i i think it's because we don't tend to understand the uh, you know the the problems with farming as well right and and it's not that aquaculture is a massive protein supplier for you know at a global scale so it's not that it's devoid of you know a lot of these interactions so it's really critical to understand that you know and also say for instance if you are eating farm chicken a lot of the food for the farm chicken comes from trawl bycatch you know it's kind of facilitated trawl bycatch to a large extent so uh yeah so it's really difficult to you know say that moving to a farming exercise kind of de decreases the pressure on the ocean in fact there's clear evidence showing that you know trawling is being incentivized by you know larger farming of animals what we do need to do is to kind of think of you know alternate ways of protein supply because even farming requires protein to be supplied into it yeah so with that i'm going to wrap this up question now i am okay there's another question by abadish pandey i'm finishing my phd in marine biology but i do not have any background in conservation science um um or i think i lost my think there's some connection issues here but the question is uh she doesn't have she's doing a phd in marine biology but she doesn't have a background in conservation science how do i prepare myself for a career in conservation and how do i shift to uh how do i shift to a, a any you know engagement in conservation science so the basically the answer is you know you just have to get into begin with interning or you know smaller opportunities to 
I have well, you done a PhD, so see where are those opportunities to apply your learning in a in a uh, in the larger context of conservation. Where do your skill sets and things you know come in handy and try and you know reach out to organizations like ours? Unfortunately, there are not too many institutions or organizations working on marine conservation issues. So you, you yourself could begin some initiatives or. You know, reach out to organizations like ours and we could help you at least direct you in, in you know ways in which you could engage on that. The next question is from Akshaya Vinod Kumar. I'm currently doing BTEC biotechnology and want to pursue marine biology in future. How could you give me advice on what I could do to learn during this lockdown? Uh, just I, I think we can help. Uh, I mean, if you write to me, I can help you structure your reading a little better. I can give you certain, you know, basic reading stuff from where you can get to more advanced stuff. So yeah, that's one way I can do it. Um, I think the lockdown is pretty much coming to an end. So you can write to me ASAP and I can help you with that. Yeah. Another question by Sasipia again. Why are there different types of intertidal zones for in single ocean? What waters are the same? We are calling it sea water, but intertidal zones vary. Um, so to answer Sasipriya's question, uh, what are the different types of intertidal zones and why are they why are we giving them different zones when they're all being inundated by the same sea water? This is a fact that, you know, uh, Intertidal rocky shore ecosystems are called rocky because they, the substrate is a rock. It's sandy because the substrate is sandy. So it's mostly dependent on, it's not the tidal zones vertically we are demarcating them. That's between, you know, the high tide zone, mid tide zone and low tide zone, which is basically the, based on how high the tide goes up during high tide and how low it goes during the low tide. Uh, that's a vertical zonation, but otherwise, horizontally across the coastline, it's based on the substrate. Um, there's a question by Meghana Tirtala. She says, very interesting talk. Could you please suggest few good books and literature on marine ecology? Of course, please write to me. I can give you, like I said earlier, I can give you that. Another question is by Ananya. Revanna, how do you meet the increasing demand for sand, especially since the supply remains the same or decreases? How does one balance real estate development requirements with preserving limited sand spaces? I think uh, there are enough technologies that have come up in recent years that doesn't need the requirement of sand for infrastructure construction, but also we need to rethink, significantly rethink how we're moving ahead in terms of development, I mean, do you need that kind of, you know, infrastructure requirements to, you know, address some of these needs, right? I mean, do we need concrete buildings and big cities built for survival or can we look at, I think that's a larger philosophical question, but I, small and short brief answer is that, you know, there are alternatives that folks have found for, you know, sand, for the use of sand in infrastructure development. Um, Sam Kamlesan asks, sir, could you please tell me what is the main cause of spreading oxygen minimum zones? I think I answered that in the talk is that a lot of uh, areas, it's kind of attributed to excessive sewage uh, being pumped into the sea and, you know, the various currents and things carrying it. Also the excessive amount of organic matter that's entering into the sea, right, from multiple sources on land. And you know, it's our human footprint that's reaching some of these offshore areas as well that's creating this oxygen minimum zones. Thank you. Uh, Saumya Prakhyat Popuri says she's got an, or uh, she's got a Ospolish, a biocure powder that is a water conditioner for the aquarium and promotes good bacteria. Can we do something like that on a large scale? Um, I, a lot of these things have been tried and tested and I mean, it works well for an aquarium tank, but we're talking about a large marine system and quite often some of these remedial measures, which are pretty much like knee jerk reactions to the, to what's happening 
and our own creations often end up creating more problems than solutions. So I would say, if you're really keen on testing this out, try it out at a small scale in some areas and see with high pollution and see if it helps. But I won't prescribe any such things at large scale unless it's been proved without any doubt that it's, it's beneficial. Thanks. Um, I'm going to take the next question, which is what is the role of microbial mediated biogeochemical cycle and how much it impacts the ocean? A little bit out of the scope of this talk. Um, it's, but biogeochemical cycles, like I said, are really critical. There's a lot of, uh, you know, huge biomass at high turnover rates is being produced and decomposed in the oceans and then circulated back. And a lot of that is thanks to uh, you know, the microbes to mediate this process. So, you know, so yeah, there is a massive role and I think I can share enough materials with you if you would like more information on that. I can't give you like quantitative stuff off the top of my head, but there is a microbial, you know, decomposition is one of the most important factors that leads to, you know, recycling of nutrients in the oceans. Shivani Sahai has asked, uh, recently saw a post that said probiotic bacteria can help um, coral reefs survive the mass bleaching. What exactly the good bacteria do um, to help? Is that practically possible? Well, I don't see how bacteria can help reduce uh, you know, mass bleaching because that is in response to a temperature change. And the kind of algae that the corals live in symbiosis with, which is not a bacteria, the algae that they live in symbiosis with tends to get expelled when there are temperature anomalies, right? So uh, if you want to address the concern of mass bleaching, you really need to address the concern of global climate change and global warming. Um, having said, said that, people are looking at more resistant strains of, uh, you know, the, the associated algae with the, with the corals and trying to implant that in, in different areas. So that's again a work in progress. Uh, Harshada Savant asks, Hi Naveen, within, with the enhanced focus on fisheries by the government and also seaweed farming, what do you think would be the best, would be the repercussions on the ecology? How best does one avoid them? Yeah, there's a, the fisheries, interestingly, the enhancement of fisheries seems to be to target more deeper sea fish you know, resources and kind of reduce pressure on the nearshore ecosystems. But that seems to be driven by, uh, you know, that seems to be primarily driven by uh, the lack of resources in the nearshore ecosystems, which is why, you know, they're promoting more deeper sea fisheries and stuff like that. So um, my answer is that, you know, yes, uh, you know, the government policies are problematic from, you know, because fish is also looked upon as a commodity. It's an fisheries is an industry, you know, it's like calling hunting an industry. So that consistent problem has been there. The, the issue of sustainability and all of that hasn't been really, you know, integral or, you know, central to fisheries development and policy work. So yes, I think we need to put pressure and all that's what organizations like Dakshin also does is to put pressure on, you know, policy makers to bring in a strong sustainability component. But factors like seaweed farming have been problematic. The big massive seaweed farming initiative that's been, you know, promoted by the government is with the invasive species. Invasive means it can, has a potential of invading, like you have rosopis and, you know, uh, lantana and few other invasive species on land, which are plants that just invade jungles and none of the local varieties can grow like that. They've initiated mass seaweed farming using an invasive species, which is again, extremely problematic and it's caused a lot of damage to, you know, coral reef ecosystems in, in the Gulf of Manar area. So there are repercussions to some of these things. It doesn't mean one should stop trying these things, but look at sustainable solutions that those should be at the core of it. You can't do, you know, alternate livelihood or, you know, alternate or look at alternate options, which themselves lead to more problems, right? So that's the problem currently is that it's more like short-sighted 
efforts than you know looking at the long side all right i think that brings me to the end of this talk yes. and Naveen, also hi is here uh, okay, sorry nice to cut you. if you don't mind in the chat window right now can you just put in your email address so that uh, the attendees who are there who want to get in touch with you for something specific or reach out to you directly could do that yeah i can do that yeah so also wanted to thank all the you know the the pictures and stuff that i showed on my presentation is thanks to a lot of uh, again a lot of people who dive a lot primarily a lot of the best pictures there are from umeed misri who is also you know a senior photographer slash you know dive enthusiast one of the leading divers in india so uh, thanks to a lot of them you know a lot of the uh, imagery in the presentation yeah so on that note i'm going to wrap up thanks sir thank you so much all right thanks navin um all right i'm i'm just going to step in and and tell you a little bit uh, about the ssi part of this talk um uh rahul you seem to have gone on mute uh can you hear me now yeah just start from the right from the top okay uh, so for the last couple of months uh, and for the months that are that are coming uh, in front of us uh, ssi india has been uh, offering a range of what we call knowledge based specialty courses uh, to help improve our understanding of the environment uh, the environment that we dive in and the animals that we love to dive with now even though we can't get underwater uh, for the moment uh, hopefully this will keep us occupied and engaged with the sport that we love namin's master class uh, today is targeted towards marine ecology but we will also have subject matter experts speaking on shark ecology sea turtle ecology manta and rays coral identification and fish identification too now these webinars are by subject matter experts and and everyone uh, is free to sign up, to sign up Uh, but this doesn't include a certification now if you would like to sign up for the ssi specialty course you will need to complete a little bit of theory and uh, an online exam to get the uh, certification for that particular specialty now it's it's actually that easy because they are dry specialty courses with which don't uh, require any diving um there are ssi india i've said as just posted the link i have to um if you click that link you will see all the uh, courses on offer uh, right now uh, you can choose one or more but we also have a great price for all six uh, ecology specialty courses uh, on offer now ssi has a coveted rating of master diver uh, which you will be awarded once you log 50 dives once you have a rescue certification and you have four additional specialty certifications this is something that you can strive to uh, to tick off the list uh, during this period because this is the the pinnacle of uh, of a non professional diving and and this car actually carries a great weightage whenever you go diving anywhere around the world so let's use this time not only not only to improve our knowledge but also to strive to achieve higher ratings in uh, in the diving system okay all the information will be available on the link that uh, is currently in the chat All right thank you so much rahul uh, thank you so much navin for doing this it was a pleasure having you you know on the webinar do this for us take the time out and uh, we hope uh, you know all the ones who all the attendees who were part of this webinar took away something from the presentation today and have learned something new and uh, hopefully all of us can help uh, you know do our bit towards conservation that is as well needed in these times and age today uh, once again thank you from the whole team and uh, guys we will yeah, be ending the webinar thank you all for organizing okay. this i mean i think this is a really you know useful and quite a needed kind of a you know webinar series and i am happy to be have you know help initiate that that's so, a yeah, great start you. navin it it's okay. been great having you here uh, guys once again just a reminder and a recap of what rahul said we we will be having a lot more webinars on marine ecology uh, and different ecosystems about sharks about turtles mantas uh, coral identification uh, you all will be getting emails from ssi india just keep a look out for the registration link 
and uh, hope to see you all be a part of our future webinars as well. Thank you so much. Okay.